1990 Boston Red Sox dedicated their season to the memory of Tony Canigliaro, the kid from Revere, who grew up to be a New England hero. His first time at bat at Fenway was a thrill for me as a Red Sox broadcaster. There's a drive by Canigliaro, and it is out of here. What a bomb he is. Canigliaro hits a home run his first time at bat at Fenway Park. And he gets a tremendous hand. What a thrill that must be for a 19-year-old boy who a year ago was playing high school baseball. Look at that smile on his face. Ah, look at that smile. Young as he was, Canigliaro had remarkable power. He was only 20 when he won a home run title, and two years later became the youngest player to reach 100 home runs. But in the midst of the Red Sox impossible dream season of 1967, Canigliaro took a fateful pitch in the face. When he was being, uh, the first thing uh, that went through my mind, because I heard the sound, is you hope that he's all right. Afterwards, they started speculating on his career. I wanted him back. I wanted him hitting behind me. He was just coming into the zone. He's always this great power hitter, home run hitter. But he learned now how to hit for an average. He became an excellent defensive ball player. Uh, he learned how to run the bases. If he'd have stayed sound, that beating never happened. He would have been a Hall of Fame player without any doubt. His whole life, uh, the passing away, uh, just seems that there was something that was always a black shadow hanging over him because, like I said, he was just coming to his own as a ball player in 67. Definitely would have made the Hall of Fame. The 1990 Red Sox season ended at the Oakland Coliseum in a crashing four-game defeat. And yet, the Red Sox had so much to be proud of. They overcame enormous odds to become Eastern Division champions. You can't be bitter over four games when, when 162 were so special. Red Sox went to spring training looking for a third division title in five years. But as any winning team knows, having the talent isn't always enough. You look at the championship teams and, you know, you look back and they all got along great. You know, they had a nice blend, a good chemistry, good attitude. The team uh, gelled together and hopefully that'll happen for us this year. To that end, the Red Sox acquired two veteran stars, Tony Pena, to fill a huge catching void, and stopper Jeff Reardon. But before the season started, Reardon had back problems, and Lou Gorman had his doubts. In the Eastern Division, if I'm a writer, I would pick Toronto as the club to beat. They're a strong club, they're defending champions in this division. They probably got the best balance, less injuries to worry about. Even most baseball experts didn't give the Red Sox much of a chance. There were questions about who was going to play first base. questions about the strength of the lineup. And so, if the Red Sox were going to be champions in 1990, they would have to do it by beating the odds. The season opened against the Tigers at Fenway Park before a packed crowd of 35,000. This is the day every fan has been waiting for all winter long. Warming up at the bullpen and right center field, number 21, Roger Clemens. Tony Giamatti, widow of Commissioner Bart Giamatti, tossed out the first pitch in a tender tribute to her husband, a lifelong Red Sox fan. There was nothing tender about Dwight Evans' first inning smash. Hit hard to center field. It may get caught. It's over the head of the center fielder to the corner. Mosby couldn't get it. Two men are going to score. Here comes Burks around. 
Here comes the throw to the plate. Burke slides. He's safe. All three score. It's a double, and the Red Sox lead three to nothing. Clemens handled the Tigers with ease. He no hit them for five innings and pitched into the seventh with a four to two lead. The Sox got another run for good measure, and in the ninth, Lee Smith came on to finish off the Tigers. The pitch, sidearm, swung on and missed. He struck him out. And the Red Sox win the opener by a score of five to two as Lee Smith comes in to save it for Roger Clemens. The Red Sox went on to win three of four, and no one got going faster than Tony Pena. Pena goes deep. Forget about this one. High and gone. Over everything, a three-run homer. Tony Pena. Diego is off, and the pitch is taken for a ball to throw to second. They've got him. Pena to Jody Reed. Three for three for Tony Pena. Tony jumped off on a 15-game hitting streak to start the season. But as well as he hit early on, Pena's greatest contribution came behind the plate, where he exceeded his reputation. It's definitely a tough job to come over and try and take over a whole new staff and, and work with him as well as he has. Just his experience behind the plate uh, naturally helped, uh, helped our pitching staff out immensely. I've given Tony 100% confidence. Uh, he calls my game, and, and I go with it, and I'm being successful. When I first came here, he sat me down and talked to me and asked me what I threw and how I like to throw. Tony Pena has been the biggest influence on my career as far as uh, a catcher is concerned. Day in and day out, Pena contributed. He caught 142 games, most of any catcher in the league. On April 25th, Bill Buckner started the Red Sox on a course of improbable events. There's a shot deep toward right field. Washington back, and Washington can't get it. The ball is loose. Washington is into the stands. Buckner is around second base. He is headed for home. He's going to have it inside the park. Home run. The way the Red Sox were playing, the Angels had to wonder what more Boston had in store for them. One night, Bill Buckner's motoring on bad wheels. Next night, Jody Reed surprising them with clout. Long drive, left field. And we will all go home. Jody Reed, a home run. Red Sox win it 5-4. Hey, the little man did it. The Red Sox were looking like the little engine that could. And the next night against the formidable world champions, they showed what they were made of and fought back to the finish. One run in in the bottom of the ninth. Oakland leads 6-5. to five. The tying runs now at third with two outs. And the winning run is at second. Now Ellis Burks. Up the middle. It is a base hit. One run is in. Here comes Pena. And the Red Sox win. Two straight ninth inning comebacks. And by the end of April, the surprising Sox were 11 and 8, one and a half games out of first. In early May, it looked as though Jeff Reardon was over his back problems, and so the Red Sox traded Lee Smith for the much needed bat of Tom Bernanski. filled the right field void left by Dwight Evans, and he brought a bat that had produced 20 or more home runs for eight years. 
and Bruno made an impact right away, most emphatically on May 19th against Minnesota. He goes deep toward right field. Well back toward the bullpen and into the bullpen for a home run. A three-run homer for Tom Brunanski. Five for five and seven runs batted in. Even with Brunanski's exploits, Boston's season was starting to look a lot like this. Up one day, downhill the next. There were bright spots in all of this, and a big one was Carlos Quintana, who was riding high in May. That ball given a ride to left center field and off the wall. They will try to score the run. The throw comes in. Not in time, and the Red Sox go out in front two to one. Quintana, too, was making an impact. So much so that in early May, he was given the first base job. That move plugged another Red Sox hole and boosted Q's confidence. He hit over 300 the next three months and would wind up at 287, just as impressive with his glove as he was with his bat. Nice play by Quintana. Deep drive to left field, way back. That's going to be way out of here. A tremendous blast by Carlos Quintana. Hard hit. Carlos Quintana makes a good play. There's a shot over short for Quintana. Nice play. Carlos Quintana leaping into the air. On a team that was finding heroes in the unlikeliest of moments, Quintana fit right in. And with a capital Q, the Sox were quickly coming on. And then came the crash. After holding their own the first three weeks of May, the Sox hit a rough spot. The low point came in a 16-0 pounding by the Twins, a game that was so lost, Danny Heat came on in relief. In the end of May, the Red Sox lost six of nine and dropped into third place. Then on June 3rd in Cleveland, the Red Sox and Indians touched off a few sparks in the midst of Roger Clemens' ninth win, and suddenly the Red Sox were off on a roll. The next night, they went home for four games against the Yankees and bowled them over. In game one, Bernanski led the way, driving in four of Boston's five runs, and Reardon shut the door as the Sox moved into first. The next night, after blowing a 4-0 lead, it took a perfect piece of strategy to get it back. Jody Reed laid down the squeeze, and the Sox won three straight. Next night, the streaking Mike Boddicker pitched the Sox to their fourth in a row. Greg Harris followed by one hitting the Yankees for eight innings as the Sox swept New York for their fifth straight win. Ellis Burks kept things cooking. He hit home run number seven, and the Sox made it six straight. Back for an encore next night, Burks banged out three hits and collected six RBIs. And out of nowhere, the Sox found a small miracle in rookie Dana Kicker, who kept the Sox streaky with his first major league win. The Sox ran that streak to seven and led the East by a game and a half. June was full of great surprises and great battles. The Sox played 12 one-run games in the month, and no one was more clutch than Dwight Evans aching back and all. There's a ball that may tie it up. Gone, home run, 2-2. Dwight Evans. Dewey was just getting warmed up. Two innings later, in the 10th, with the Sox trailing by a run, he came up against the Orioles' ace reliever, Greg Olson, who'd gone 115 innings since giving up a home run. And that was to Evans. I'd hit a home run in this game on Saturday to tie it and came up against Olson, who was an extremely tough pitcher, their closer. And it was competition at its uh, highest peak. He was coming after me with his best stuff, and, and I was jumping up on top of the plate, and it was just him and me, and it was, to me, that's the ultimate. There goes a high drive to left field. This may do it. It is gone for a home run to win the ball game. Oh, mercy. I 
didn't hit it real well, but I, I hit it good enough to get out of the ballpark and it won the ball game. And it was a big thrill to see the guys around home play coming around third base, knowing that we had won a ball game and a tough ball game come from behind. And those are the kind of wins you have to have to win a division. But you can't win a division without pitching. And there was the rub. In June, just as the Red Sox were picking up steam, John Dobson's questionable elbow was no longer a question, and it was learned he would be lost for the season. Dobson's loss might have been a bigger blow to Boston's pitching staff, but Joe Morgan had gone to the bullpen and found an able replacement in journeyman reliever Greg Harris. His stint as a starter was supposed to be temporary, but with Dobson gone, Harris stayed put. And in bailing out the Red Sox, Harris won seven of his first 10 starts. In June, he combined on two shutouts, the second a five hitter for eight innings against Baltimore. Harris's masterpiece was finished off by Jeff Gray, an unknown rookie who did yeoman work while Jeff Reardon was in traction. In this game, he retired the side in the ninth for his first major league save. Red Sox could put their pitching worries to rest, at least for now. But on June 25th, in came the Blue Jays and shades of trouble. Junior Felix with an inside the park home run, and that blows the ball game wide open. Red Smith home run, and the Blue Jays have come all the way back in Boston, in Boston, in Boston. If the Red Sox were going to win the division, they'd have to beat the Blue Jays at home, something they hadn't done in three years. If there is to be a climactic series in the month of June, I suppose this is it. At stake tonight, simply first place in the American League's Eastern Division. The Jays lead the Sox by one half game. The Red Sox are yet to win against the Toronto Blue Jays in three years here. They got a 15 game streak. Something's got to give. In game one, the Blue Jays scored three runs in the top of the first, but then their ace, Dave Steeb, gave out. The Sox jumped all over Steve for six runs in the bottom of the first and quickly sent him to the showers. But in the third, John Olerud brought Toronto back with a two-run homer. The seesaw battle swung Boston's way in the sixth when Jody Reed let forth an unlikely blast. There it goes, deep left field. Up and right on top of the wall for a home run. Jody Reed puts the Red Sox ahead eight to seven. A lead they held on to for dear life. Well, prior to that, I hadn't beat them at Fenway, and you know. We're very accustomed to beating teams at Fenway Park, and for some reason, we, we couldn't snap that jinx against Toronto. However, this year it has just been different all around. Uh, it, obviously, the different attitude, and hey, what's happened in the past is in the past, and now the streak of 15 games is gone by the boards now. Cito Gaston's headache got worse the next day. Wes Gardner opened the game by retiring 13 straight Blue Jays, and the Sox marked their offense with a capital Q. And Carlos drills one high and deep. Forget about this one. It's long gone and hard to find. Three nothing, Boston. The Red Sox held on to win, and the next night poured on the offense up and down the lineup. Red Sox pumped out six runs in one inning alone and entrusted a 9-5 to five lead to Jeff Gray. Again, stepping into the heat of the spotlight, Gray delivered. And incredibly enough, the Red Sox were on the verge of sweeping the Blue Jays and capping their second seven-game winning streak in June. The possibility looked all the more real with Roger Clemens on the mound in the finale. Tough as usual at Fenway, 
Clemens held command for eight innings. And then came Jeff Reardon. He made a valiant comeback from 10 days in traction to save the first two games of the series. Now he's coming through again. This may do it. Popped up in a shallow right. Jody Reed gives way to Brunetsky. The game is over. The Red Sox sweep the Toronto Blue Jays. Well, it definitely meant a lot because, uh, you know, there was so much talk about how Toronto would play so well here, and uh, we knew we had a good ball club, and we knew we could beat them, and it was just a matter of doing it at home, uh, which we haven't done in a long time. So uh, uh, once we won the first game, we just uh, got, got loose and, and, and really felt like we were going to win every game, and we did, and, and without a doubt, that was probably the biggest series of the year for us. That homestand had one sweet ending. Mike Boddicker was pitching against Texas and bidding for his 10th straight win. But his esteemed opponent, Nolan Ryan, was making things difficult. Still, Boddicker hung tough, and the score was all even in the ninth when Texas brought in Kenny Rogers. His first order of business faced the man who scored the tying run, Kevin Romine. They brought in a left-handed reliever, and I'd gone up there in that inning, and the guy threw me some good pitches. I fouled off a few pitches. I was just trying to battle to stay alive, and. You know, he happened to throw me a pitch that I could handle. And I, I, it kind of surprised me that he threw it there because he'd be coming in real hard earlier in the count. And then he threw a pitch that I could handle out over the plate and happened to hit it. Long drive, left field. It goes up and it goes out of here for a home run to win it. Kevin Romine. Everybody right there as Romine delivers into the screen. At the moment I hit, I wasn't sure whether it was going to go out or not because of the way the wind had been blowing in the whole day, and everybody said, you know, you probably wouldn't be able to hit one out. And it kind of surprised me. It caught me off guard. You know, you kind of feel great. You're around first base, and it goes into the net. And I know it's kind of hard to describe, but it's, it's one of the, you know, one of the most emotional moments that you can have in baseball. Romine's homer capped Boston's 9-2 and two homestand and pushed their lead to four and a half games, a far cry from a month ago. But it was too good to be true. And before the Red Sox knew what happened, their good fortune was slipping away. They stumbled into the All-Star break and stumbled right out, losing 14 out of 18. To make matters worse, Jeff Reardon would have to have back surgery and his season looked finished. Mike Greenwell's batting woes typified the frustrations of the team. Greenwell had a woeful first two months, hitting below 240. But while everyone was looking for the old Greenwell to reemerge, his physical problems persisted. And playing with a bad ankle was tougher than he thought. I thought I could play through it, and I tried, and I tried. And uh, by the All-Star break, I realized that I, I was uh, doing nothing but hurting myself worse, and I really wasn't helping the team like I was capable of doing. But thanks to a cast that was fitted to his ankle, Greenwell came back strong in the second half of the season. Actually, what had happened, uh, tendonitis had set in the tendon, and uh, they decided to go with this uh, cast that I, I've been wearing, and uh, they gave me cortisone shots and uh, medication. And uh, since then, I've really turned my year around and was able to, able to come back second half and, and do what I was capable of doing, and that's helping us win ball games. Greenwell, a deep drive to right field. Way back toward the Kansas City bullpen and out of here. You may as well forget about this one. Uh, to right field, deep toward the bullpen, and gone. Home run, Greenwell. I think he raised his average from 250 to 290, just like that. And the home runs and the RBIs came. So it was a big difference. I mean, people were saying uh, that he was just having a terrible year, but I think it was just a matter of his ankle, and uh, he's proven that. Greenwell wound up batting 297 and finished fourth in the league with 181 hits. <laughs> Meanwhile, in July, nothing was coming easy to the Red Sox. In this game against the Twins, even winning was getting ugly. Nobody out. Tom Brunet. 
Stefanski will be up. Nothing nothing game in the bottom of the fourth. Third base. One there. Two there. And a triple play. Holy mackerel. Believe it or not, two innings later, the Red Sox found themselves in the very same situation. has been made tonight. Two triple plays in one game had never been done before until tonight. Embarrassed though they were, the Red Sox won the game. Tim Naring's first major league hit drove in the only run. Red Sox fans were seeing double the next night. In fact, so were a lot of the Red Sox. Jody Reed, after hitting into a triple play the night before, got Boston started on another dubious record. a double play ball to short. Newman turns it in the middle, so all of a sudden, two double plays have eventuated in the first inning. The Red Sox went on to hit into a team record six double plays. Only in this game, they turned the tables on the Twins. Hitting away, and let's see if they've got two. Reed, Bennett, and they get the double play to set a record. Major League record for double plays by two teams in a game, 10. The big thing was we won those ball games, and uh, you know, as a player, you understand the kind of roller coaster ride you're going to go through because this is a very long season, 162 games. Uh, it's not a sprint; it's definitely a marathon, and you're going to have your ups and downs. Uh, you can't pick when those ups and downs are going to come, and you just got to try to ride them out. By late July, the four and a half game lead was long gone, and the Sox needed to regain their winning way. There was one constant bright spot, and that was defense. Wow. Wow. The Sox got back on track and streaked into August with six straight wins to regain first place. In the midst of a West Coast swing, they went to Seattle and battled the Mariners in an unforgettable back and forth contest that epitomized Boston's roller coaster season. And we had a lot of things going in that ball game out in Seattle. 3 2 pitch. Breaking ball chopped slowly to short. They'll try for two and they won't get it. Box scored and the Red Sox have the lead for the first time of the ball game, two to one. No one could outdo what they did. Red Sox rally caps worked. Now the Mariners. A little bit of an Arabian twist. Red Sox trying to counteract the rally caps with the gloves on top of their rally caps. Back and forth, back and forth. Base hit right field. Rumble's being waved in. Gurdansky's throw to the plate, not in time. Pena down to second. Safe. The game was tied and went into extra innings. I had had an opportunity to, to drive in a run earlier in the game and uh, struck out with a man on third with less than two outs. Now the payoff pitch. Strike three. All the guys with the rally caps on the shaving cream, they're trying to outdo the other side over there. <laughs> <laughs> I think these boys are tired. I knew that they were pulling for me and pulling for anyone to really hit a home run or just drive in a run. Deep to left field, way back, it is gone! Wake up New England, Dwight Evans, his 11th home run of the 
the season. And the Red Sox have a 4-2 to two lead. I'm not the only one that's done something like that. There's a lot of those type of wins this year, a lot of big hits that won ball games that were important hits. By the time the Red Sox won the game, it was 2.30 in the morning back in New England. But now, Sox fans would sleep a little easier knowing their team had pulled out another one. The Red Sox then went to Oakland and lost two out of three to the West Division leading A's. But in the middle game, the perspective was all Roger Clemens. You talk about those last four starts, well, 4-0, 0.81 ERA, 33 and a third innings, only 29 hits, 31 strikeouts, and check out the walks, only three base on balls. The A's found out they were trying to hit the wrong man. Clemens was on fire, and batter after batter heard the same refrain. Strike three. Strike three. Strike three. Strike three. Clemens dazzled Oakland. He struck out 11, and at one point left 15 straight A's in his wake. And a high pop-up. Under it, Jody Reed. And this one is over. Win number 17 for Clemens. His third shutout in five starts. And believe it or not, his first win ever at the Oakland Coliseum. With pitching like that, the Sox were set to face the Blue Jays a week later in Toronto. This is what the baseball season is all about, heading down the home stretch with a series between the top two teams in the American League East. The Red Sox come into this series with a two-game lead over the Toronto Blue Jays. This time, Dave Steve had his stuff and departed in the eighth with a three-to-one lead. But before Steve knew what happened, Mike Greenwell jumped all over the first offering from Tom Henke. Well hit ball, right center field, way back, and it is gone! A two-run homer, Greenwell's ninth of the season on the first pitch thrown by Henke. Steve can't believe it as the Red Sox have tied the game at three. What a shot by Greenwell! But in the bottom of the ninth, Mookie Wilson raced a third at a wild pickoff throw, and with two on, Kelly Gruber came up. Broken bat down to third. Barnes comes to the plate. Safe with the tightest Wilson, and the Blue Jays win. Toronto's victory cut Boston's first place lead to one. In game two, Joe Morgan surprised everybody when he set down Clemens for an extra day's rest and gave the ball to rookie Dana Kicker. Three days earlier, he didn't get out of the first inning. But now, kicker threw eight shutout innings. And with a score nothing nothing in the ninth, Mike Marshall found a hole. Base hit left field, and the Red Sox will take the lead one to nothing as Boggs comes home. The Red Sox scored another run and went up two to nothing. The Blue Jays were stymied by Red Sox pitching and couldn't do a thing against Jeff Gray. Gray retired the side, and the Red Sox won it, going up two games on Toronto. The next day, Clemens, pitching on five days rest, was the pitcher of true grit. He overcame three infield errors and justified Morgan's hunch by allowing only five hits. And in the sixth inning, when Tony Fernandes threatened to put the Blue Jays ahead, Clemens came up with a little something extra. In the seventh, with the game scoreless, Dwight Evans took advantage of David Wells' only mistake. Breaking ball, line to left field, and it's a home run for Dwight Evans. A line drive homer, and Evans breaks the tie. Evans gave the Red Sox a 1-0 lead, and Clemens made sure it held up. He pitched out of jams in the seventh and eighth innings, and then was at his best in the ninth when he got into another fix. Bases loaded, two down. Here's the one-two pitch to Manny Lee. Swing and a miss, strike three, and the ball game is over. A big win for the Red Sox. And Boston has now won two out of the three games in this series and have opened up their lead in the American League East to three games. Red Sox pitching was contagious, and in the finale, Greg Harris caught the shutout fever. He pitched brilliantly into the eighth, giving up only two hits. And when the Blue Jays threatened, luck intervened. 
Two men on with one out. No hits in the inning. A hit batsman and a walk. Now John Olerud. Ripped up the middle. It hit the mound. What a great break for the Red Sox as they turn the double play. The ball was well hit by Olerud, but it hit the mound. That slowed it up. Reed able to get to it. And the 4-6-3 twin killing ends the inning. The game was scoreless in the eighth when the Red Sox tried to get something going and got another break. The score stayed one to nothing, and for the second time in the series, Jeff Gray came on to save it, and save it he did. Struck him out! Three straight shutouts, and the Red Sox lead atop the American League East is now four games. The Red Sox had climbed back up to the top of the East and were still soaring when they went to Cleveland. Pitching gave way to power, and in the fourth inning, the record books gave way to Ellis Burke. Burks came up again in the same inning and again cut loose. Burks goes deep left center again. Mitch Webster on the run. That ball is gone. He started the inning with a home run. And as the 10th batter of the inning, he rips a three run homer. It's 9 0 Red Sox. I tell you, it was exciting. Uh, the funny thing about it, I was being interviewed afterwards that uh, I told him I didn't realize, you know, that I had hit two home runs in one inning. And I had said to someone, Hey, is that a record or something? And then the next day, everyone said, you know, you're only the 23rd or 24th player to do that in history. I was like, wow. So I was pretty excited. Ellis's power show was a topping on a season that produced 21 homers and 89 RBIs and certified Burks, one sweet center field. Sox were putting Cleveland in a stupor. The Red Sox trying to sweep the Indians, and moreover, they're trying to do it with Roger Clemens looking for his 20th win of the year. There you see Roger Clemens' 89-year-old grandmother, Myrtle Lee, who was watching her first game in person at a ballpark. She's watching Roger pitch tonight, and he promised if he goes the complete game, he's going to present her with the game-winning ball after the game. Clemens delivered on the first part of his promise. And this should do it. Rudansky there, and Roger Clemens has won his 20th ball game. And again, a dominating performance. Clemens then kept the second part of his promise, handing the prize ball over to Grandma Myrtle Lee. Clemens was in the midst of a brilliant streak in which he won eight in a row, four by shutout. Every time out was a blaze of glory. Two two pitch. Right three. He is pouring the coals right now. If I'm on and and uh, Tony's right with me, staying right into the ball game, that this is going to be tough to beat us. Roger Clemens has his 100th major league win. A masterful job out there tonight. Every time he goes out there, you expect to win. Roger Clemens has pitched a shutout and a brilliant one here at County Stadium. Every challenge that I get, I enjoy being out there. No way, Jose. Clemens dropped down, and Dakota strikes out. Roger Clemens, the all-time leader in strikeouts for the Boston Red Sox with 1,342. At the end of August, the Red Sox went home and against the Yankees brought their winning streak to 10. Shot down the right field line, fair ball. Quintana scores. Boggs scores. Here comes Burks. The ball gets by in right field and three runs score. And here comes Greenwell with an inside. 
inside the park home run. You know, the old saying, the ball's bouncing our way right now, and, and, we, and we need to try to run away with it. Hopefully uh, get a big lead, and that way, uh, you know, we won't have to come down to the last four or five games and worry about that. Hopefully we can, we can open up a big gap and, uh, and keep winning. If we're, as long as we're winning, they can't catch us. Green Wells inside the park Grand Slam helped the Red Sox climb to their biggest lead, six and a half games. But as has happened so many times this season, it didn't last. On September 4th, Roger Clemens, fresh from a perfect 6-0 August, had an uncharacteristically bad outing against the A's and left the game with inflammation in his pitching shoulder. The Red Sox collapsed. They lost 15 of 20 and dropped from six and a half games in front to one and a half games back of the Blue Jays. But on September 26th, Dana Kicker won a big game against Cleveland, and Randy Kutcher filled it admirably for Wade Boggs, who was out for two games with a sore back. The victory here gave the Sox a chance to regain first place in Detroit. The Red Sox come into Detroit a half game behind the Toronto Blue Jays. A win tonight means they go into that series with the Jays, tied for first. A loss, they're one game out. That's a big difference. Tom Bolton, making the biggest start of his career, pitched seven strong innings and erasing his record to 10 and 5, denied the Tigers almost every opportunity. Boston got its opportunity in the fourth inning, and Mike Greenwell took advantage. Well hit, fair ball down the right field line. Quintana scores. Evans is right behind him. A double for Greenwell, and the Red Sox lead 2 to nothing. In an almost miraculous return, Jeff Reardon stepped in to save the game. No one had figured on Reardon's return from back surgery. And now in the ninth inning, he had a chance to put the Red Sox into a first place tie. The 0-2 pitch. He struck him out. The pride of Dalton, Massachusetts, with a huge save is 19th for the Red Sox. The Boston Red Sox head into the series with the Toronto Blue Jays, tied with Toronto for first place. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a special night at Fenway. Red Sox and Blue Jays in a big ball game that all of New England is talking about. A standing room only crowd has filed into Fenway Park for tonight's game one of this three game series. Red Sox and Blue Jays with first place on the line. In the opener, Wade Boggs was back, and in the sixth, he came through. Well hit to right field. Felix on the run to the wall. Boggs woke up the packed crowd with his first home run in almost three months. And then the power shifted to Bruno. Bernaski with a deep drive to center field. Wilson looking up. That ball is gone. Cito Gaston and the Blue Jays trail the Red Sox. Four to nothing. Four runs looked like enough, even at Fenway Park. But in the seventh, Mike Boddicker started to lose it. He gave up two runs and departed for the usually reliable Larry Anderson. But Anderson couldn't escape more trouble. In the hole, tough play off the glove of Quintana. Felix being waved in and he will score. And it's a tie game, 4-4. But the tide turned back in the eighth when Mike Greenwell took advantage of a Blue Jay miscue. Gruber played it on a tough hop. Low throw scoots through McGriff. Greenwell, high throw, he's safe. With Greenwell, the go-ahead run at second, White Evans forced the Blue Jays into another mistake, this one costly. Can't get Greenwell. High throw into the dugout, and the Red Sox take a 5-4 lead. But in a game that epitomized Boston's up and down season, the Sox were about to crash. Felix, deep drive to right field. It's gone. A two-run homer for Junior Felix. And the Blue Jays take the lead. It's six to five. But in the bottom of the ninth, the Red Sox rallied against Tom Hinkie. With the biggest crowd in two years pleading for them to stay alive, the Sox loaded the bases with one out. 
backed up by Hankey. Mike Greenwell with another huge base hit. The game is tied at six. Bases loaded. Infield in. Jeff Stone, the batter. Stone has not had an at-bat. He's appeared in seven games. He needs to make contact, and he does. The unlikeliest of heroes puts the Red Sox in first place. Bog scores. Stone's hit wins it. 7-6 Boston. As a player, you, you know, you like exciting games, but uh, not that exciting. I mean, that was uh, a lot of emotions right there. Uh, I wish I had this game on tape. I might uh, watch this three or four times in the offseason because it, that's what a team's all about, what we did tonight. The Red Sox went a game up on Toronto, and the next day, all of New England anxiously waited to see if Clemens would be back. Roger has to go out and try this. It's like in this city, Bill Russell and Larry Bird have tried to do the same thing. Common sense probably would have said they shouldn't. Roger's on a mission to, to say, I'm going to show you I can do this. Clemens declared himself fit to pitch, and after three weeks on the sidelines, made a dramatic return. Raising his record to 21 and 6, Clemens shut out the Blue Jays for six innings, and Tom Bernanski let loose. The 1 1 pitch, it's hit deep to left field. Way back, way back. Gone. Home run on the screen. With runners at second and third. One out. Here's a drive. Deep to left field. Looking up. It's gone. Another home run. Here's a drive. Let's see if it'll be a home run. It is. Another one for Bernanski. Three home runs. His last three times up. Four homers in the last two games. And Bernanski has exploded, and the Red Sox lead it now 7 to nothing. But even a seven-run lead wasn't safe. In the ninth, Kelly Gruber hit a grand slam and cut the lead to 7-5. to five. It was now up to the miracle worker, Jeff Reardon. A lot of guts out on that mound. That's what makes him one of the best in the game. One strike away from his 20th save of the year. And a pop-up, and this should do it. Wade Boggs, and the game is over. And the Red Sox have narrowed the magic number to three. The Red Sox could cut the magic number to one with a win the next day, but even the cloud of Tom Bernanski wasn't enough. Bruno hit his fifth home run in three games, but the Blue Jays pulled themselves from the brink of extinction to beat the Red Sox and leave town one game back with three games to play. With a chance to clinch a tie, the Red Sox now had to face the team with the second best record in the league. But if Joe Morgan started to get that clinching feeling, he soon changed his mind. The White Sox overturned a 3-0 Red Sox lead in the eighth inning. And with a runner on second, Chicago was threatening to go ahead. He hammers at the third. Boggs with the stop. The long throw in time. Great play by Boggs. And great news from Baltimore, where the Blue Jays were losing. All the more incentive for the Red Sox to rally. In the eighth, with Ellis Burks on second, the onus was on Evans. Base hit up the middle. Burks comes on. He will score. It is four to three, Boston. The score stayed that way into the ninth. The Blue Jays lost their game, and Reardon was again the man of the hour. Sox win it. Toronto loses. The Red Sox are up by two with two to play. But the next night, a combination of missed opportunities, a White Sox comeback, and fate conspired against the Red Sox. They lost to Chicago in 11 innings, 3-2. to two. The Blue Jays also won, and the whole season came down to one last game. There were no more days left. And now the Red Sox knew that destiny lay in their hands, and they seized every chance. In the second, Mike Greenwell got things going with a double, and Dwight Evans took it from there. Red Sox threatening in the second. Up the middle. Base hit past Scott Fletcher. Greenwell's being waved in. 
Johnson's throw to the plate up the line. Greenwell scores, and the Red Sox lead one to nothing. The Red Sox wanted some insurance, and Tom Bernaski gave it to them. Base hit right field. Evans being waved in. He will score as the ball gets by Sammy Sosa. Bernanski on his way to third. He is safe at third, a triple, and a 2 nothing Boston lead. Moments later, the Red Sox caught a break. Here's the squeeze, and they pitched up. Bernanski. Now Fernandez. Fernandez threw it away. Bernanski's going to try to score. And he will. The Red Sox catch a huge break. 3-0 Boston. The Red Sox carried a three-run lead in the seventh when Mike Boddicker faced a sea of trouble. Bases loaded. The 2-1 pitch. Live in the left field, a base hit. Thomas scores. Pass was coming to the plate. He is out by a mile. All pain you had to do was hang on to it, and he did. Boddicker survived the threat, and the Red Sox went into the ninth leading 3-1. But with the Blue Jays winning their game, the Red Sox had to win this to avoid a playoff game with Toronto. Nothing has come easily for Joe Morgan and the Red Sox this year. Tonight is certainly no exception. The White Sox with runners at first and second. Line down the right field line, hooking toward the corner. Catch in the corner. A great catch by Tom Bernanski. And the Red Sox are the champions of the American League East in 1990. The celebration had to go on without Roger Clemens. He'd gone ahead to Toronto in case of a playoff. Roger's in Toronto. That's why we're doing this. He wishes he was here. I told you, Roger, before the game, and I tell Roger, Roger, don't go to Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> I pitched the uh, last game in the World Series in 87, but coming back after the surgery and all that, and being a Red Sox fan my whole life, this. This meant more to me probably than the seventh game of the World Series. A right fielder diving into the wall to catch the final out. I mean, that's just the way this team's made up right there. I'm just happy to contribute to this ball club. I mean, you know, we've come a long way, and it's just fun when you got all the guys coming together and playing for one another like we have. This is just a great bunch of guys. We believed we were going to win it, you know, from the get-go, and, and here we are. We won it. This was the Red Sox' last victory. They would get swept in the playoffs. But as Wade Boggs said, you can't be bitter over four games when the 162 were so special.